let's just look at what we're going to be covering today. Hold on. Just one second. <laughs> there we go. Right. So um, what we're going to be covering today, we're going to cover a range of things. But we're going to start off by looking at, uh, you know, what is a brand? Um, you know, sometimes we think we know what a brand is. But what is a brand and how does this wow factor work? The wow factor, what we're talking about. And then we're going to look at um, some tips for how you can uh, either strengthen or develop from scratch your brand identity and, you know, the strategy around that, how that works. And then we're going to move along to looking at, you know, what it takes to understand your market's needs. So the people, um, your customers that you're going to be trying to reach or people that you currently have as customers, you know, what are their needs, how you can look at that um, and how you can center your, your brand around that. Uh, we're going to be looking at ways to make your collateral messaging consistent. And then uh, towards the end, we'll be looking at some resources and then we'll have time for Q&A. So let's just first start by looking at, you know, what is a brand? Um, you know, a lot of times I think, you know, as I said, in our heads, like we have this idea of, you know, like we'll look at, you know, Coca-Cola, for example, and, you know, it's like, oh, that's a brand or, you know, Disney, whatever it is, that's a brand. But, you know, over particularly the last 20 years, um, you know, researchers in both communications and psychology have looked at, you know, how it kind of all works. And they found that it's much more about, you know, like it's much more on an emotional level um, brands are. So it's it's, you know, based on, you know, a promise. So, you know, you're looking at this brand as, you know, what is it going to do for you? Um, you're looking at, um, you know, as an individual, like your perception of the brand and how you view the brand. So it's like really close to, you know, kind of what you believe, your beliefs, um, kind of how you see yourself. It's, you know, an expectation, not only of what the brand will do, but also too of what people will think of you, like when you, you know, uh, you know, associate yourself with this brand. Um, it's about persona as well. So, you know, how you're seen uh, using this brand, what you believe that, you know, the brand kind of represents, and then like the different elements that kind of make up the brand as well. So, you know, packaging, um, you know, advertising, all those different things. What a brand is not is, you know, it's not a trademark. So it's not, you know, you know, McDonald's, I'm loving it. It's not Coca-Cola, you know, whatever their trademark is. It's not that. Um, it's also not a specific product or service either. So it's not for Apple. It's not just the iPod. It's not just the iPad. It's not, you know, corporations. And it's also not something that's strictly tangible. So again, a lot of it is based much more on emotion and a lot less on just the actual product that you can have. So when looking at, you know, what is this wow factor? Um, you know, essentially what the wow factor is, is it something that is unique specifically to your business? So it's based, you know, any type of product, service, or experience focused element. And you'll hear me talk about experience focused a lot um, because often the wow factor is really driven by experience focused um, actions within a business. So, you know, it's something that, you know, often catches customers off guard. So it could be, you know, for example, you know, if you have a client, if you have a retail store and they come up to the cash register and they, you know, have something to purchase and then all of a sudden you whip out a promo code that's saying, oh, actually, you know, you get 20% off today. That's just like an example of, you know, like one type of a wow factor um, event that could happen uh, where, you know, you're just really impressing them. So it's something that catches them off guard positively. And again, it creates added value and makes them want to tell someone else, you know, hey, like, you know, this just happened to me at this store. It was so exciting. Um, and, you know, no matter what industry you're in, you can, you know, apply that example and do something like that. So that's what the wow factor is. It really is like making them say wow and making them really impressed. And, you know, it kind of puts you a step above your competitors because you're just creating this added value for them. So in looking at, um, you know, some of the worldwide brands that we know that have the wow factor, um, you know, one of the things I will say is that most of the brands I have listed here and kind of some of the ones that you probably think about that, you know, really impress you worldwide, they all have, you know, the experience uh, focused part of it, like really, really driven into their messaging. So it's like if you look at, you know, for Disney, for example, you know, like, from the time that you book your trip to the time that you go and you experience. You know, it's about like the entire experience they have with Disney. When you go into an Apple store, you don't just kind of run in just to buy something. It's like you want to go in there and, you know, play around with the different gadgets and test it out. And so it's like an, ex it's an experience. You know, if you've ever been to the UK um, in London, if you go to Harrods, um, it's one of the most luxurious uh, stores in London, but it's not so much about going in and buying something really expensive. It's about walking around and having the experience. So, um, you know, particularly for 
you know, any type of brand that you've been really impressed with, you'll probably think about the fact that it's much more of an experience and how the product actually makes you feel and a lot less about, you know, just just buying a product just to be buying it. So when looking at how you can develop a strong brand identity, um, there are essentially kind of three different parts to that. So the first thing is to think about, you know, how you want to define your brand identity internally. So, you know, like thinking about, you know, from a business perspective, how you want to define your brand and what it's going to mean to customers, what it already means to your current customers as well. And then you need to look at understanding your target market. So, you know, obviously, if you're already an established business, you have a target market, but, you know, that's always changing. So you need to understand, like, you know, where's the market at now? Where am I now? And who are my target customers? Um, and, you know, that works towards acquisition of always bringing in new customers. And then um, you also need to focus on retention. So a lot of times this is something that can get left off. You know, people are always focusing on, you know, getting the new customers in, but you also need to make sure that you're focusing on your current customers as well. So, you know, definitely working on ways to uh, build that strong identity for retention. So uh, towards the steps that you're going to need to take for uh, determining your brand identity, there's uh, four different, you know, kind of steps here. So the first one is, you know, looking at the features versus the benefits of your brand. And we'll go into more detail about that. And then you need to define your USP, which is your unique selling point or unique selling proposition. Uh, we'll talk about that. And then um, using uh, this tool called the Brand Wheel. Um, it's something that's been around for about 25 years now. Um, and uh, we'll talk about how you can use that. And then from the Brand Wheel, you will be able to create a brand essence, which is, you know, really, really important to helping you kind of solidly defined your brand. So when looking at the features versus benefits, now this is something that a lot of people, uh, whether you're in marketing or whether you are just in business or not, like a lot of people often get this confused. So it's like with yes. features, <laughs> yeah, very much. <laughs> with features, um, you know, this is, you know, anything that basically describes what your business does. So, you know, from, you know, the quality of, you know, whatever you're providing to the customer service, delivery, pricing, packaging, it's basically what your uh, business does. Now, the, the good thing about features is that they can be converted into benefits. But you need to be very clear about what your features are of your product or your service or the experience, whatever. And then you can convert those into benefits. So with the benefits, those are what, you know, describe uh, what the customer will be receiving uh, for or from the product. So, you know, like you need to just be very clear on that. I um, mean, again, often with the benefits, you can kind of tell the difference between a feature and a benefit because a feature is much more tangible and a benefit is often, you know, something more emotional or something that's intangible, you know, created around uh, added value. And one of the things about <clears throat> understanding features versus benefits for your own business is that not only is it going to be something really useful for branding, as Kimber's going to continue to tell us, but these are also the sort of things that you can use when you're creating your marketing materials. So for your emails, when you're creating your emails, including a benefit for um, your product or service in your subject line can really help drive opens on your yeah. email because as Kimber said, it's something that's more of an emotional connection rather than, hey, 50% off. So knowing what the benefits are versus the features will work great when you're doing your emails, when you're doing your social media, if you're writing blog posts, those are things that are gonna come in handy in a lot of other areas. Definitely. So now let's look at defining your USP. Um, so, you know, this is your business's unique selling point. So this is what, you know, makes you unique from your competitors and makes you unique within your industry. So you really need to be clear on that as well. Um, this is something that helps, you know, to guide customers in the decision making process as well. So, you know, if a customer comes into your shop and, you know, they're still in the kind of phase where they're going to be like, you know, looking around, they may ask, you know, like, well, you know, what makes you different from, you know, the store down the street, you know, so you need to be very clear about, you know, what you offer. And then this is where you, you have a chance to promote the key benefits, you know, of your brand. So, you know, you already know what the features are. And, you know, a lot of times the features might be similar to your competitors, but here are the benefits of what you're going to get from, you know, my product, my service. So, um, you know, definitely have a key grasp on your unique selling point. 
So now looking at, um, you know, using the brand wheel. So this is just a really, you know, useful tool, um, you know, when you're trying to do any type of uh, marketing and looking at branding. Um, some people call it the brand onion, actually, because it has like the layers <laughs> there. So, um, you know, you want to start uh, from the outer part and then work your way in. Um, so looking at the attributes now with the attributes, essentially think of those as like they're similar to features, but it's just a little bit broadened, broadened out. So it's like it's basically anything that has to do with your product service. Um, you know, anything. So, you know, from the packaging, from the way that, you know, the packaging feels, anything that, you know, relates to um, the features of your product, those are the attributes. So, you know, if you want to like take out a sheet of paper or whatever, when you're, you know, working this out at some point uh, down the road and, you know, starting with a brand will, you know, first of all, you need to be clear on what the attributes are and you can link those in with your features. And then, of course, you move along to the benefits. So, you know, we just talked about what those are. So you need to be very clear about, you know, what is the customer going to be receiving from this? How is it going to make them feel? And then it's when you look at customer values next. So with customer values, that's where you're going to be looking at, you know, how does your brand stack up against like what the customer values? So you can look at it as in a sense of, you know, like the, your target market, like who are those people and, you know, what are their values? What do, you know, they believe in? What are they really looking for? You know, are the benefits that your product gives them, is that really useful to them? So you need to be very clear about, you know, what their values are and try and align um, your product if it's not already to, you know, what they're looking for. The next thing is when um, you go in and you look at the personality. So you need to be very clear about, you know, what your personality of your brand, you know, like what does it say, you know, what does it kind of mean? And again, that goes back to, um, you know, more of the persona of the brand, like how is it going to make people feel, you know, what do they feel like when they're, you know, using your brand? What do they, you know, believe in when they're using your brand? What does it say to other people as well? So those are like the four uh, basic parts of the wheel. And then you come to the fifth part, which is the brand essence. So with the brand essence, this is essentially, you know, summing up your product or service in one word. So, you know, like what you'll start to do is you'll start to see different themes as you go through the different parts of the wheel. And then it'll just kind of like make sense. Like I've done this plenty of times. So it, it actually does eventually make sense. But you just kind of go through and, um, you know, like it, it brings you to the point where you're able to sum up your product or service in one word. And this will help you, you know, define like what your brand actually is. So, you know, like again, like, you know, how does it make customers feel? That's one thing that, you know, kind of leads you to know that, okay, I'm on the right track for thinking about the brand essence. And then also too, like understanding that, you know, this is basically your brand's single best intangible attribute. So it's something that, you know, is unique to you, but it's intangible for people. It's not something that they're going to, you know, physically walk away with. So we look at some examples of, you know, brand essence. So, you know, with Nike, you know, their brand essence is inspirational. You know, they're an inspirational brand. Yes, they're, you know, for health and fitness. They help people, you know, get in shape through their products. But, um, you know, it's, it's all about inspiration. And you see that, you know, in their marketing and their ads, all those different things. Disney, you know, they've been selling magic since forever. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, it's all based around, you know, magic, the experience. And, you know, the first thing that people think about when they think about Disney is typically magic, the magical experience. With Volvo, you know, safety. It's, you know, all about the safety. It's known as the safe car. It's all about the safety. And then with JetBlue, you know, against their competitors, against the kind of bigger airlines, they're known for, you know, being people oriented and, you know, being focused on people. So again, it's, it's much about like, you know, you want to think about like, what would be the one word if someone, you know, mentioned my brand, what would be the one thing that they would say? That's your brand essence. Right, so now that you kind of done, you know, all of the fun internal stuff of looking at, you know, kind of what the branding is and what, you know, the essence is, now you need to focus on your customers because you need to, you know, know who they are before you start putting out, you know, all of your branding and your marketing and everything. So there's three different things here that I have that um, I think will be useful for you. So the first one is reputation check-ins. And then um, surveying your audience, so, you know, doing surveys, uh, hosting surveys, and then uh, using feedback to fuel productivity. So we'll talk about these three things. So the first thing is reputation check-in. So with this, this is essentially where, you know, you need to figure out, um, number one, you know, what is being said about your brand? So, you know, there's no matter where it is, whether it's, you know, you have a e-commerce site or you have a, 
uh, make and border a uh, brick and mortar um, you know business it, it doesn't matter you know people are talking about your business somewhere so you know leading to the second point you need to figure out where people are discussing your brand so you know it could be in online forums it could be on a website like Yelp it could be you know TripAdvisor it just depends on your industry and in every industry there's some you know type of website or forum where people discuss different brands so you need to figure out where that is um, you know doing you know quick searches or you know whatever you need to do to figure out where people are actually discussing your brand because uh, it's really important to kind of know what people are saying about you know your brand because that's part of your reputation and also as well you know keeping a note of negative responses I mean obviously in any type of business it's you know it's pretty standard you're gonna get a few negative responses you can't please everyone but you know if there is any type of theme where, you know, even if people are giving you so-so responses, but, you know, they're saying, well, you know, the beginning part of the service was okay, but, you know, I didn't feel that, you know, it matched what I believe that they would do for me, whatever. So if you see themes within the reviews or the responses, you know, take note of that because that could, you know, be a sign of a bigger issue of something that you would need to look into. So the next thing uh, that I would recommend is, you know, doing surveys. You know, surveys are really, really useful because they give a snapshot of, you know, a wide range of opinions because, you know, typically you're going to be using surveys for, you know, current customers, but also potential customers. So it gives people like the chance that are at either kind of spectrum um, of whether they're, you know, thinking about purchasing something or have already purchased and used it. So it just gives you like more of a well-rounded sense of like what people are thinking about and you know this is a chance where you can get a better idea of you know like what they're really interested in. Um, also too it's just really important to note that you know it's useful at any stage of a business so it doesn't matter if you know your business is six months old or you know you've been operating for 60 years like you you know always need to do surveys because the market is always changing people's needs are always changing so you know you always need to be kind of you know up to speed with what people actually want um, because your target market can you know easily change. And again, just a note on surveys, you know, please keep them engaging and short. You know, people don't like to fill out 30 question surveys, um, you know, unless it's, you know, really, really mandatory. So, you know, try to keep or it. Or you're giving them a lot of money. <laughs> exactly. You're giving them a lot of money. <laughs> so, you know, just keep it, you know, short and engaging um, and straight to the point. So with feedback and customer insights, now this is kind of it's it's related to surveys but it's like a little bit um a little bit different because like with this um in my opinion it's like you you use the customer insights and feedback um to go a little bit deeper so as i was saying you would generally um as i was saying here you would generally you know target this towards current and recent customers um and this gives you you know more of an opportunity to you know really kind of delve down and you know like get like real you know kind of answers because you're not just kind of asking them you know yes or no uh questions so you know it allows you to be a lot more direct and allows you for the opportunity to, you know, kind of include added value. So one of the examples I always think about is, you know, like when you, a lot of the stores that you would go into now, like I'm just gonna use the example for Walgreens, but a lot of stores do this. Like when you get up to the counter and they ask you, you know, did you find everything okay? It's like, they're not just asking you that to, um, you know, have conversation. A lot of companies have implemented now where they want you to, they want their, um, employees to ask you that because they have found that you can actually gather some intel from um, you know the shoppers um, or whoever um, during that period so it's like you know a lot of times you would be like oh yeah I found everything okay but it could be a chance where you know you're like actually I didn't find what I was looking for and you know I might check in you know CVS or something and then that's a chance for the person to say oh you know here's a coupon you know, will have it in stock next week or whatever it is so you know it's there is you know some value into that so it's like when you're able to kind of talk to customers more one-on-one -on -one and delve down into you know kind of what the experience was like for them it's just really useful and you can't always really do that in a survey. So ways to collect feedback, um, you know, obviously if you have a website, that's a really good way um, to do that. You can either have a section on your website for feedback or, you know, like a dedicated email that, you know, just kind of pops up and, you know, they can just send um, to the email address. Or, you know, if you you know want to do something that was more like survey related where, you know, that just pops up on the website and, um, you know, they can just type in their feedback, that would be good. Or again, as I was saying, you know, like the example for the in-person, if you want to do it directly, so, you know, right after someone, um, 
you know, maybe not directly after they purchase, but, you know, if they're a repeat client or a customer or, you know, like maybe even like a week after they've purchased and you want to, you know, just give them a quick call or an email to, you know, say like, I would, you know, really like to, you know, just spend five minutes talking to you, getting some feedback about how, you know, the product is treating you, how you're liking it, you know, is there anything that you would change different? So, um, you know, that's really, really useful. And, you know, most people, they typically won't mind if you do that, particularly if you just say, you know, five minutes. Um, so, you know, another thing you can do, too, is, you know, an on-site feedback box, um, you know, if you just want to have something, you know, where it's kind of like a how are we doing type thing, and, you know, people can just drop that in. It can, you know, be about their experience or about, you know, if they're a repeat customer, you know, something that they're, you know, interested in towards your brand, and it just makes it a little less awkward instead of having to, you know, ask them right then, well, how is the service, and, you know, how are you finding it? They can just kind of drop it in and be gone. The other thing, too, is, you know, if you wanted to, um, like I was saying before, like email people, you know, just really quickly and, you know, say like, hey, can you just give me, you know, like 50 words or less, you know, like quick feedback of how the product is, how it's working. It just kind of shows as well that, you know, you're creating a little bit of added value there as well because you're showing concern, you know, for checking in and, you know, kind of being concerned about how it's treating them after the process. So that's something that's really uh, valuable. So when looking at um, establishing a brand identity, so now, you know, you have the first two parts where you've done the internal kind of analysis, and then you've done the middle part where you've looked at, you know, the customers, who am I going to be reaching? Now you need to figure out, you know, how am I going to establish my brand identity so I can, you know, put it out into the public. So we're going to cover uh, the things listed here. So looking at the consistent uh, collateral messaging and the importance of that. Um, looking at, you know, producing engaging marketing campaigns, um, you know, maximizing the capacity of social media. Again, going back to creating consistent added value. And then um, another recommendation I had is, you know, you could become a local authority within your industry. Um, and this could help you, you know, kind of, you know, establish your brand even more and get people talking about your brand. So when looking at um, consistent collateral messaging, um, you know, this is something that is really, really important because, you know, this is what kind of signifies your brand. So it's like, again, if you think back to, you know, Apple or Disney or, you know, Virgin Airlines, whatever, it's like their branding is so, you know, strong and it's so cohesive. And, you know, you don't need to feel overpowered, you know, if you're a small or medium business, you can do the same thing. Um, you know, but you just need to make sure that, you know, all of the messaging works together so that when people see, you know, your logo or when they see your tagline or when they see, you know, the pink, white and green, they know that it's your brand. So, you know, there's a lot of different things working there. You know, for some people, for example, their logo is like, you know, speaks for their brand. So with Apple, it's like when you see that Apple, you know that it's Apple. You don't need to. Um, you know, figure out what brand is this, you know, or like even like with the with the Starbucks, you know, like with their uh, symbol, you know what brand it is. So, you know, if you particularly want to like make your logo as like the main messaging tool um, for your brand, that's OK. Um, but, you know, a lot of times people will say, well, you know, I want to make my logo part of it, but I also, you know, really have these distinctive colors that I want to use for my brand as well. So you just need to make sure that whatever it is, you know, if it's, you know, a situation where you use a lot of um, unique images um, for, you know, your marketing messaging and people know, you know, by the images, oh yeah, you know, that's Susie's Cupcake Shop. Like, you know, you just need to make sure that it's all cohesive and it all makes sense towards your brand and it also fits, you know, obviously within the identity that you're trying to present so that it, you know, it all makes sense and works together. And this is inclusive as well. If, you know, when you're sending out email campaigns, you need to make sure that, you know, the coloring and the logos and everything just makes sense, that people just, you know, quickly understand what it is. So producing um, engaging marketing uh, campaigns. Now, you know, this is something, too, that, you know, people can often get wrong. And again, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, even a big brand, like a lot of big brands get this wrong. Um, you know, it just, it needs to be something that is actually engaging. So it's like when you say, oh, I want to, you know, produce a marketing campaign, it's like, okay, but, you know, what does that mean? Uh, one of the things that a lot of people can get wrong is that they don't focus on highlighting the benefits when they're doing, you know, marketing. Um, so again, it goes back to what I was saying before, you know, it's like, yes, you want to talk about what the features are because that impresses people, but you need to dig a little bit deeper and talk about the benefits because again, that reaches people, you know, in their emotional side of things and makes them think more about, oh yeah, I actually do need that new car or I actually do need that new shirt or, you know, I do need that cupcake, whatever it is. So especially the cupcake, exactly. Especially <laughs> the cupcake. So, uh, so yeah, you know, just 
just make sure that you are highlighting the benefits. But again, not like shouting it at them. You can, you know, just do like subtle ways of highlighting the benefits. Um, you know, using compelling images and punchy text. Um, you know, we've seen particularly over the last 10 years, obviously that, you know, people, the way that people are consuming things uh, changes, the way they're consuming messages, you know, the way they're reading things, you know, they don't have a lot of time. And so you want to make sure that, um, you know, your images are compelling and the text is punchy and, you know, upbeat so that, you know, they can just kind of look at it and be like, oh yeah, you know, I'll go back and look at that later in more detail. But, you know, this is really interesting. I want to check that out. Um, and then also, too, just thinking of, you know, new ways to search and look for new customers. So that goes more back to the acquisition part of it. So, you know, just thinking, you know, about like, you know, yes, you have your target market. But um, remember that, you know, everyone, you know, as a person, everyone knows someone. So, you know, even if, you know, they don't necessarily need your brand, if they see it, they may, you know, forward it on to someone else or whatever. So, you know, kind of keep that as, you know, back in the back of your mind. So when looking at um, ways to maximize the capacity of your social media channels, now this is something that, um, you know, is kind of important as well in the sense of, you know, a lot of people forget that social media is actually meant to be social. So it's like, you know, when you're spending a lot of times doing other things, um, you know, like posting things and, you know, all of that, that's good. But you're also meant to be social, to be interacting with other people because, you know, there's a whole wide range of potential customers there, um, you know, people that could give you really good feedback. So don't forget about that. So, you know, the first thing is to know where your audience thrives. So, you know, this is something that's important, um, particularly, you know, I would think for small business because you know you you may not always have like a lot of time to spend on social media like every day um, but you know thinking about like you know if your um, audience if your main target audience is just on Twitter it's like that's okay I mean like I think there is a lot of pressure for people to you know be on Twitter be on Facebook be on Pinterest be on all these different social media platforms but you have to think about you know where you're being best served and you know where you're gonna get the most um, you know, kind of action for what you need. And so, you know, it's like, I would recommend that, you know, you do have your brand on, you know, all the platforms, but really think about, you know, if Twitter, for example, you, you know, you got five sales last week through Twitter and this week you got seven, you know, Twitter is probably the place for you where you're going to be needing to spend most of your time. So definitely know like where your audience lives and focus on that, um, you know. And so like the next thing is to focus on quality over quantity. So again, that's something that's also important. Um, you know, I think a lot of people get caught up in, you know, like how many followers I have, how many likes, how many people are, you know, sending this and that. And that is, you know, important, but um, because it, you know, helps to spread your brand around. But you also need to be focusing on, you know, like the quality of the things that you're posting to people. Um, when you're replying to people, you're sending a message, you know, make sure that that's, you know, quality. And that means, you know, like it's well thought out. It's, you know, there's no misspellings or anything like that. Like you want to put that out there as well because remember that the people that are following that are looking at you you know they followed you for a reason and so you want to make sure that you're providing them with the best uh, content that you can um, another thing that you can think about is automating your content. Now, this helps a lot because it allows you more time to be social. So, you know, using something, um, you know, like Buffer or Hootsuite where you can just kind of go in, you know, sit down on a Saturday or Sunday and put in, you know, kind of all the messages that you want to go out at, you know, you, you can, you know, do it as you choose. And then it's like, you don't have to worry about like, you know, getting online for, you know, an hour and posting different articles. It's like, it's already there for you. So then when you log into, you know, Twitter or Facebook or whatever, you can just be social and actually use it for what it was meant for. Um, another thing that I think is important when looking at social media is that you can actually use it to, um, as I like to say, smooth the business rough edges. So, you know, like you can use it, you know, as a platform for people to, you know, give you feedback or, you know, if you saw someone like, you know, actually having a complaint about your brand, you could, you know, actually respond to them and, you know, kind of smooth that over, maybe offer them, you know, some type of promo code or whatever it is. So don't just kind of use it just to kind of interact with people in a positive way, but look for opportunities where, you know, if there's someone saying something about your brand, you can kind of make it a little bit better and, you know, turn things around. And I think that's a great point because a lot of times people think if they see a negative post on their Facebook page that they should delete it because they don't want to yeah. have other people see a negative comment. But as Kimber just said, it's a great way to turn around people's thinking because if you have people who are very invested in your business, they're going to say, woohoo, look at how awesome they are at handling this jerk. Um, which is probably what they'll think if they're exactly. saying something negative. But it also gives you a chance to win over the person who is saying something negative by being really public and transparent about what's going on and what you can do to make it better for them. Yeah. 
No, I agree. And it's like if you look at, you know, websites now like, you know, Yelp and TripAdvisor, it's like you see more and more where companies are getting there and responding and they're not just kind of letting it sit there. So, yeah. you know, it's definitely something that. Uh, but and also as a consumer myself, I like to see yeah. the negative things. Like I yeah. use TripAdvisor a lot for when I'm traveling or um, even if I'm just looking for a restaurant sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I always look at the five star reviews and the one star yeah, reviews because absolutely. I want to know the worst thing someone can say about something. And if I think that it's just kind of silly or it's unimportant to me, then I'm like, whatever, sounds great. Absolutely. So absolutely. I think having the negative ones can actually be a positive thing for your business too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the other thing too is just to remember, um, and this goes back to what I was saying about being social and social media. You know, you don't just have to you know follow or interact with people that are, you know, within your industry or, you know, like related to kind of your business and what you want to do, make sure that you cast a wide net when you're on these social platforms. Because again, you know, someone, they may not need your service, but they may know someone that's looking just for that. So remember to, you know, follow different people that may not necessarily just be in your industry. It's important to cast a wide net with that. So when looking at uh, creating added value, consistent added value, um, you know, this is just really important because you want to, you know, make sure that, you know, customers are getting something out of your brand that's, you know, not going to necessarily be tangible, something they walk away with, but something that's intangible, which is, you know, kind of the whole point of, you know, creating a strong brand. Uh, so one of the things is, you know, make sure that you view your customers as, you know, lifetime advocates. So you don't just, you know, even if it's a, something where, you know, your customer's going to be purchasing something just one time, it's like they, you know, may, you know, run into someone that's like, hey, you know, what about this? You know, do you, have you ever heard of someone that does this? And you can be like, they can be like, yes, you know, like, I know that. So think of them, you know, as people that are going to be championing your brand, you know, for the long haul. That's really, really important. Um, you know, one of the things that I particularly like is more the personalized experience. So, you know, like just making it much more personal for people. So it's like, even if you don't have a lot of time, it could be something where like, you know, after someone purchases something at your store or online, you know, you may send them a handwritten note or, you know, send them a personalized email. It's not just, you know, um, you know, an automated email. You may not be able to do that for every person, but um, particularly, you know, if they bought something or they bought something of a higher value, you know, just doing something like that um, just makes it a little bit more special for people. Um, you know, just makes them feel like they're actually being recognized and not just kind of, you know, just purchasing something. So, you know, focusing on the personalized experience, you know, you may do something where it's, you know, around people's, um, the anniversary of when they bought something or even on their birthday or whenever it is, you know, just doing that um, to make it a little bit more personalized and more kind of a added value situation. Um, another thing too that you might want to consider is you know having an added value standard gift. So this would be something that you know people were not really expecting. Again, as we talked about before, but you know like with any purchase over you know fifty dollars, they get this standard gift. So again, that creates some type of added value. And then the other thing too that you can think about is creating you know a customer loyalty program. Now I know with uh, small and medium businesses, you kind of get scared like oh you know I'm not Target, I can't have a rewards card. <laughs> but you know you can create some type of you know customer loyalty program um, that, you know, just focuses on people that, you know, have been championing your business and, you know, have been, you know, shopping with you and, you know, talking you up. And so, you know, definitely think about um, establishing something like that. So becoming a local authority within your industry. Now, this is something that, um, you know, I just think is really interesting. I think particularly for small and medium businesses because it, you know, just kind of, I think, just gives you a little bit more of an edge, like particularly on the local level. So, you know, see it as free publicity. So, you know, this is something where, you know, you would be much more kind of advocating yourself um, within your local community, but it helps you, you know, get your brand name out there. So uh, one of the things that a lot of people like to do is, you know, there are, you know, so many different career panels and events, you know, for people looking, you know, for, you know, jobs or whatever, and they always need people, you know, to speak. I mean, typically these types of things are, you know, going to be free, so you wouldn't be getting paid for this, but it's just an opportunity to, you know, get your brand out there, get your name out there. You know, if there's any type of event within your specific industry as well, uh, where you could, you know, be a speaker, you could, you know, just be there, um, you know, just be able to kind of advocate yourself and, you know, actually, you know, kind of get your name out there. That's a really good option. Um, another thing, too, that's really important is, you know, you should always try to, um, in any way that you can, it doesn't have to be, you know, in great detail, but, you know, establish some type of working relationship with local industry uh, beat reporters and journalists. So people that are, you know, locally reporting, you know, within the industry that you, um, 
are working in. So, you know, there's no matter what city you're in or where you are, there's always, you know, those local reporters that are there. And a lot of times, you know, you'd be really surprised. Like, they don't always have people to, you know, call on and ask questions when they want interviews. So, you know, you can, you know, kind of take that initiative and reach out to them and say, you know, hey, like, you know, I, you know, own this business. This is what, you know, I do just so that, you know, when a story comes up, they may actually, you know, reach out to you. And, you know, another thing you can do as well is you can actually, um, you know, set up, for example, in Google or in uh, being, you can set up like alerts and you can specify it specifically like for your area so that, you know, when a story pops out, um, you can look and say, you know, hey, like they wrote this story and, you know, get in contact and, you know, you never know like what may come from that. So definitely, you know, keep abreast of um, the local reporters um, and uh, news, you know, people that are within your field locally. Another thing that you can consider as well is the potential, um, you know, co-sponsorship opportunities. So again, these are often free in the sense of, um, you know, you may not always, you know, get paid for this. It may be something where, like, you know, if you're teaming up with a local charity or another um, another business as well that, you know, they may do some advertising for you, you do some for them. So it may not be something where you actually exchange um, actual money, but it's really good, again, like free publicity as well, because you're, you know, working um, with, you know, another uh, business or, you know, a charity or a nonprofit, and you're just getting more exposure, you're getting more exposed to, you know, you're getting exposed to their clients and their customers as well. So, you know, consider it as free publicity, but something that also kind of pushes your brand out there a little bit more. So it's really uh, something that is really good. So in summary, um, let's look at, you know, what we talked about. So the first thing, of course, is to define your strategy. So working on all the internal things, looking at, you know, figuring out what your brand is, figuring out your features and your benefits, all of those things. You need to define, you know, your strategy. And then from there, you, of course, be able to move along. And, you know, once you've gone through and, you know, you've, figured out the brand will and the features and the benefits, you'll be able to, you know, establish like, what is my identity? What is my brand's identity? What do I stand for? And then, of course, you'll move along to, you know, your customers, because that's the whole reason for why you're here and why you're doing it. So, you know, understanding your customers, um, you know, this will help with your brand messaging as well, but understanding, you know, what their target, uh, you know, the target market, what they're looking for, what their needs are, and how your benefits of your products actually fit their needs. Um, and then again, just going back to, you know, making sure that, you know, you're using engaging marketing campaigns and, you know, your collateral and your messaging is all succinct and all makes sense so that people are actually interested. So here are a few resources here that, um, you know, I'd just like to recommend to you. The first one, um, you know, it's a VR marketing blog. It's a shameless plug, but not that shameless. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if you go on there, I mean, there's, you know, in every single um, area of marketing that you could think of, you know, there's just some great articles there. So I would definitely recommend, um, you know, you looking, um, you know, obviously you probably want to start off with the branding, but, you know, definitely look um, at the blogs there. It's also free. And it's all about marketing. It's not about using our products. So it's really an excellent resource for all kinds of information about marketing your business. Yes. Um, another one that we have here is the USA Marketing. Now, um, they talk a lot about, you know, branding items and how to go about branding and understanding it. It a, a little bit more into, like, the brand will and all that. So, you know, definitely check them out as well. Um, Interbrand. Um, Interbrand is one of my favorite sites. Now, with Interbrand, they focus on stats and brand rankings. Now, of course, they do focus on, you know, like the bigger brands. But, you know, I think something that's important to remember is that, you know, within any industry, it's it doesn't, uh, you know, operate in a vacuum. So, you know, if something's happening with a bigger brand in the industry, you know, it could funnel down in some way to, you know, your brand, maybe, you know, in a smaller way, but it's like it's an industry. So, you know, things are changing, different stats are changing. So, you know, be abreast of that. So definitely check out Inner Brand, you know, if you're interested. You know, the other thing I would say about that is you, of course, don't have the same kind of money and resources to do the sort of marketing that like Coca-Cola does or the brand marketing that they do. But that doesn't mean that you can't be inspired by what they do or learn from their mistakes. So yeah. I don't think that you should completely ignore the fact that there are these huge brands out there and that you can take a piece of what they're doing and make it your own. So I think it's yeah. a good place to get inspiration and understanding how it's working for them is probably important too. Yeah, absolutely. 
And then the last one I have here is just, it's uh, smallbusinessbranding.com. And uh, one of the things I like is they have some really good uh, podcasts, actually. Um, they're really short, actually, as well. Um, so it's about, you know, branding and, again, like more about like the brand essence and how do you define your USP. So definitely check out um, their podcast on there.